stress, fear, depression, spiritual warfare. Are you weighted down? Do you need refreshing? Welcome, welcome everyone to the Warriors for Christ podcast, where we seek to uplift, edify, and encourage you to be light and salt in a dark and tasteless world with your host, Kyle. Well, welcome to Warriors for Christ podcast. Uh, I'm Sam. I'm here by myself. Kyle is not with me. I'm doing another recording for, from home. And today we're going to continue and pick up on righteousness. Uh, what does it mean to be righteous? Are you righteous? Would God label you as that? So this is part two. Uh, part one, we looked at the Old Testament passages. Now we're going to continue. Now we're going to look at the New Testament passages. So with that, why don't we open in prayer? Father, I thank you, O oh God that you are an almighty God. You give the gift of righteousness, the gift of the Holy Spirit that does an impossible work inside of us, that removes the heart of sin, cleansing us from all unrighteousness, and gives us a new heart and a new spirit, filled with all the fullness and the deity of God, so that we can now walk as Christ walked, be holy as you are holy in all of our behavior. This is so much more beyond just thinking, but how we live, as the power of God and the Spirit of God takes hold of our life. I thank you, Father. Bless the reading of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so as we start off, we're going to start in Matthew. And, you know, one of the things is I'm looking here in the book of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says, she will, bear him, uh, she will bear a son, this is referring to Mary, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, a lot of people don't have the full context of what that means. A lot of people identify with the fact that he saves us from the penalty of sin. But where people are confused and don't understand the full teaching and the power of God is that we're to be converted from a sinner to a righteous man so that we don't practice and we don't walk in sin anymore. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 2, I think it's verse 24, uh, it tells us why Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it says, And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we, being dead to sin, might live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. Now, there's a lot more before that, and we'll probably cover more when we get to the book of 1 Peter. But there's something that the good news and the grace of God does. And we covered this in the true grace of God stand firm in it, in that episode. If you haven't listened to it, I, I pray I encourage you, listen to it. The word of God is powerful. It reveals the truth and the power of God and what we're to be putting our faith in. So with that, uh, let's continue to get started looking at um, New Testament passages. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus speaking on the Sermon on the Mount. In verse 6, he says, Blessed in those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. There's a life that we are to live. We are to produce the righteousness of God. You know, in verse 8, it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Are you pure in heart? Do you have a pure heart? Has all the wickedness been removed from your heart? Has it now been filled with the righteousness of God, the gift of the Spirit, the gift of righteousness? In verse 10, it says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, you could say, well, what, what does that mean? Well, it's living a righteous life. I know that as I continue to read the Bible, Jesus makes it clear. You know, later on, uh, Jesus, when he's talking about in verse 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. It is an outward result that the power of God and the Spirit of God does when one, a person's born again or spiritually baptized into Christ. You see, Jesus says, again in chapter 5, Verse 17, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. See, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now, some people still don't understand what we just read. What does it mean that he did not come to abolish, to, but to fulfill? Well, when you keep reading in verse 19, it says, Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches the commandments, he shall be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. 
For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, what was the problem with the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? Well, the problem is they just had an outward righteousness that was fake. It wasn't coupled and combined with the inward righteous. You see, God requires both. But the second is only true if the first, if you have a new heart. And then Jesus goes on and talks about sin. And if you continue to stumble, your whole body will be thrown into hell. But we'll leave those passages for another day in an upcoming episode when we talk about the dangers of falling away, shipwrecking your faith, and losing the hope of salvation. Now, uh, continuing on in Matthew, I want to go to chapter 13 and verse 41. So Jesus, after he'd already talked about the parables of the seed... And we know that there are four seeds. And then he talked about the seed and the tares, wheat and the tares. He goes and he says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41, The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all the stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness or sin. And he will throw them into the furnace of fire, in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Well, what's he talking about here? Well, it's very simple. Do you commit or do sin or are you the righteous man? Have you been converted by the power of God? You see, the difference is in not just the inward change, but also the outward result. Those who continue to struggle with sin and continue to stumble, well, the problem is they're going to be cast into hell. They don't get to enter into the kingdom. You see, we're starting to see again in the New Testament here how God distinguishes the difference between a righteous man and a wicked man. You know, as you continue, even towards the end of the chapter, uh, he ta- they talk about gathering a, a fish, right? The kingdom of heaven in verse 47 is like a dragnet cast in the sea, and they gather fish of every kind. And when it's filled, they go in, they start separating the good and the bad. You see, there is a such thing as a good and the bad. Verse 49, so will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from amongst the righteous. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire, and that place will there be weeping and gnashing of teeth. As we turn over to Matthew chapter 23, uh, again, we have a reference to righteousness. Uh, in this case, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. Now, when he speaks to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, verse 25, he says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup of the dish, so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. So you too, outwardly, You appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So you see, when you look at this again, here you have an example where in the eyes of men, uh, the Pharisees and the the, the different people here, the scribes, uh, outwardly, they appeared beautiful. Outwardly, they appeared righteous to those around them. You know, much like many people in the church today, many religious people, leaders in the church, uh, They think they're righteous men. And then their deeds follow them. And you hear about scandals and this. But all that, all the entire time, was still living in the heart because they still had bad hearts. They weren't free of sin. And there's many people, you find out later, they were never free. They always struggled with sin. Many times you'll hear church leaders from their own pulpit. They'll say, well, I still struggle with sin just like you. Well, that should be a warning. They're, They're testifying with their mouth that they are not a child of God, nor are you. Uh, so it's it's something, you know, again, it's important to understand. And we, we covered a lot of this in the heart of God. Um, you know, God requires a new heart, part one and part two. We look at both the Old Testament and the New Testament passages. So it's important that we understand what righteousness we're talking about. Now, the inward righteousness does produce an outward righteousness. But in the eyes of men, people can have an outward righteousness, but still have sin or struggle with the thoughts inside of them in their heart. That's not righteousness of God. That's not a righteousness that pleases God. Uh, Continuing on, let's go over and look at some passages in Luke. Now, in Luke, we're going to have some examples of what God says about some people. 
And Luke chapter 1, verse 6, uh, you have Zacharias and Elizabeth, uh, and they were the parents of John the Baptist. Now, when you look at this in verse 6, it says, They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. Uh, again, here as you look at this of what God defines as righteous in the sight of God, it wasn't what they believed. It was a belief that had an impact on their life and how they were able to walk. When you look at verse 17 of Luke chapter 1, uh, we have some insight in here and it talks about when, when uh, here this is referring to John the Baptist. Uh, in verse 17 it says, it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Well, for what purpose? To turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Again, it's, it's, it's a behavior. It's a way of how we walk. Continuing on in Luke chapter 2, We'll look at a passage here uh, when, I think it's uh, Simeon, who was a uh, priest at the time, when uh, Jesus was brought before him. So, referring to Simeon, it says in chapter 2, verse 25, And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And again, uh, this was a man, you you always, when you hear about the righteous men, there was something about them. Well, they had a heart of God. They had the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was upon them. As you continue, we're going to go to Acts, and we're going to look at Acts, and again about uh, righteousness. And what God says, and here uh, Paul is speaking, and let's see what is said. In Acts chapter 24, in verse 14, it says, But I, this I admit to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve, the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets, having a hope in God which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. In view of this, I also practice to maintain a blameless conscience, or to hold a blameless conscience, both, both before God and before men. And Paul talks a lot about this, about um, a conscience, that in his conscience, he's, he has a clear conscience before God. Uh, because in godliness and holy sincerity, he has conducted himself in this world. And that's discussed in Corinthians. Uh, and there's other places. And I think we talked about, uh, we did an episode of how do you have confidence before God? And we looked at that. Well, uh, it's a life. A, a life that you live in godliness and holiness. Your conscience knows. Because your thoughts know your own thoughts in your heart. And the life and your standing before God. Continuing on in the same chapter... In Acts chapter uh, 24, Paul again, when he's speaking to Felix, in verse 24, some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess. And he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. But when he was discussing, being Paul, righteousness, self-control or mastery, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened. And he said, go away until I find time to summon you. Again, it's People know when you're hearing the truth and you know that the judgment of God is coming and God will judge according to your deeds, and we're going to cover that again, as I mentioned previously in an episode coming soon, then yeah, there, there, there is a fear of God. Because when you know God's nature and His standard, then you know whether or not the power of God dwells within you and whether or not you've received of a new heart and whether or not you're abiding and walking in the Spirit of God. It's very clear and evident if you are and if you aren't. It's the proof of sonship whether you are a true legitimate son or you're still the ill legitimate son. In Romans chapter 2, we continue to talk about righteousness. And again, in righteousness, there's always, there's an obedience. Um, the Spirit of God, you can't help but to obey. It's just like Jesus. Jesus always was in obedience to the Spirit of God. 
doing the will of the Father. And we have all those stories in the Gospels. And we covered those. We went through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, looking at um, what does the power of God do? Who are those that inherit salvation? Who has a blessing? Here in Romans, uh, in Romans chapter 1, uh, and we covered this in the episode of Romans chapter 1, but remember, why was Paul made an apostle? Why did he receive grace and apostleship? Well, in Romans chapter 1, verse 5, it says, "...through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for His name's sake." What do we mean, obedience of faith? Well, again, we're, we're, we're talking about looking at uh, righteousness here and what does it mean to have righteousness or what does it mean as God defines who is righteous. Well, when you look at the gospel, continuing on in chapter 1 of Romans, in verse 16 it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What does it mean? It's the power of God for salvation. Now, some people may not fully understand that statement. When you read through the whole book of Romans, God explains what that is. But in verse 17, some additional insight is given. For in it, or in the gospel, this power of God for salvation, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. When each person comes to God in faith, a true faith, the righteousness of God is able to be revealed in their life. The power of God, converting them and changing them from a slave to sin to now a slave to righteousness in their life, in their members. Why can I say that? Because that's exactly what God explains as you keep reading the book of Romans. As we continue, and we'll go look at some of those passages, in chapter 2 of Romans, it talks about, again, a change. Now, at the end of the chapter 2, it talks about who is a true Jew, not one who is one outwardly, but one who is inwardly. True circumcision isn't that which is outwardly in the flesh, but true circumcision is that which is of the heart by the Spirit, not by letter, but by the Spirit of God. And its praise is not from men, but from God. Now that's the very last verse in chapter 2 of Romans, uh, chapter 2, verse 29. But before that, he talks about uh, what happens. What does it mean to come to repentance? And what righteousness are we talking about? Well, in chapter 2, verse 5, as we read through, he says in Romans... But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. According to his deeds? I thought there was no such thing as a righteous person. Well, we know that there is. We covered that in part one, looking through the Old Testament. We're going to see it as we continue to go through part two of the New Testament. Well, let's see. What does he mean by according to your deeds? Well, in verse 7, he, gives, he tells us what it is. To those who by perseverance, you see, even as Jesus said, you have to endure to the end. It's the one who endures to the end that will be saved. Many will fall away. But do you endure? Do you have perseverance? In doing what? Doing good. Doing good and seeking for glory, honor, and immortality. Those who do that, well, they get eternal life. Uh, but in verse 8, to those who are selfishly ambitious, do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. People say, oh, I obey the truth. I said, okay, do you obey unrighteousness? Do you have sin in your members? Well, then you don't obey the truth. Then you have wrath and indignation. You see in verse 9, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil. The man who does evil. Do you still do evil or sin? Again, do you have to confess your sins every night? Well, then you still do evil. There's going to be tribulation and distress for you. doesn't matter, Jew or Greek or Gentile. It's the same. But... In verse 10, glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good or does what is right, the righteousness of God. To the Jew first and also the Greek. You see, there's no partiality with God. Uh, All those who sin without the law will perish without the law. Those who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. In verse 13, it says, it is not the hearer of the law who is just or righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified or will be righteous before God. The doers of the law, well, I thought by works of the law, no man could be justified or be righteous. Well, that's true. Works of the law, outward works, well, that's what the Pharisees and the scribes did. Outwardly, we already read that. They were righteous before men, but they still had a bad heart. They still had bad thoughts. Even though they desired to serve God, they wanted to draw near to God, they sought to do good and righteous deeds in their actions and their behavior, that was just outward. They were still full of robbery and wickedness in their heart. 
They still had wicked thoughts. They were defiled on the inside. But someone who is able to be a true doer of the law, as Jesus taught, a fulfiller of the law, not just outward but in the heart, which Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5, he says if you have the thought of anger, well, then you're already guilty. If you have the thought of lust, then you're already guilty. Murder, adultery, guilty, even if it's in your thought. Jesus taught that when he taught about, does your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees? You see, they had outward righteousness, but not inward righteousness. God requires both. You can have an outward, but not an inward. God will see through it. But when you have an inward, then you automatically will produce an outward. Now, in verse 14, it tells us, when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having a law are a law to themselves. Well, where is it? It says it's written in their heart. Their conscience bears witness, and their thoughts will accuse or defend them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Continuing on, I know in Romans chapter 3, verse uh, 10 and 11, it says there's none righteous, no, not one. There's no one who understands, no one who uh, seeks God, no one who does any good, not even one. Well, that's all those who are born into sin. That's all those that are still under the law. That comes from Psalms chapter 14. Go read it. It talks about the wicked man, the fool that doesn't know God. Psalm chapter 15 then talks about the righteous man, the man that does know God, who does no evil. He says he will dwell with God. He will abide with God. And these are simple things, but people, because they don't understand and let God instruct them fully, they come to false conclusions and false narratives. But there's a righteousness of God through faith that is revealed. Well, what is this righteousness of God through faith? Well, it's revealed more in Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 6. It's a righteousness. See, in Romans chapter 5, verse 17, it says, If by the transgression of the, uh, of the one, death reigned through the one, then how much more those who receive the abundance of, the, of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ? Hmm. Well, what's this gift of righteousness? Is this just some title? Is this just some escape from the penalty of sin? Or is it actually truly being converted into a new creation and becoming a righteous man because that's the only fruit that we bear? Well, in verse 21 of chapter 5, it says, So as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And you can say, again, same question, through righteousness. Is this through a righteousness out of ourselves, like not of ourselves, but something else? Uh, meaning we could never, ever live in righteousness? Or is this a righteousness that we receive, this gift of righteousness or gift of the Spirit that does an impossible work in our lives to free us from sin and the practice of sin and now make us a slave to righteousness and the practice of righteousness? Well, Romans chapter 6 has that answer. And I'm not going to go through all the chapter in detail, but we have an episode on it. If you haven't listened to it, I, I encourage you, listen to it. Your life depends on it. But a couple things. One, you can't continue to live in sin if you've been baptized with Christ. Why? Because you died to it. Sin is put to death. That's the whole rhetorical questions in the beginning of the chapter. How can you continue to live in something that's dead? And verse 4 talks about whether or not we're now walking in the newness of life. If you've been baptized with Christ into His death and raised in the likeness of His resurrection, then the same power and glory that raised Christ is the same newness that we're supposed to walk in. And the same power we're to walk in a newness of life. In verse 6, it says that our old self was crucified with Christ in order or so that our body of sin might be done away so that we would no longer be slaves of sin. What does it mean to no longer be a slave of sin? Well, it says the one who's, who's, um, who has died is now justified or now righteous, declared righteous from sin. Well, what does that mean? Well, it talks about that Christ only died one death to sin. The life that he lives, he lives now to God. And all, us also, in verse 11, we're to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And then he tells us what that means in verse 12 and 13. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. That's right now. That's in your current life, your earthly body. You are no longer to have sin living in your body that you obey its lust. Well, the question was, was it put to death? Was it circumcised? Was it removed? Was it crucified? Or do you still have that old heart? Do the thoughts still war and wage war within you and your members? You see, in verse 13, it says, And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and the members of your body as instruments of righteousness to God. That's right. We are now to live 
no longer as a slave to sin, but as a slave to righteousness. The members of our body are now no longer to have sin, but to be slaves of righteousness, instruments of righteousness to God. You see, somebody who's been crucified, sin no longer has master over them because they are no longer under law, but they're under grace. Now, most people don't understand what that statement means in verse 14. Now, we just did an episode that talks about what is the true grace of God? We're to stand firm in it. What does it mean to be in the grace of God? Most people don't have a clue because it's not being taught in churches. Listen to that episode. It was a recent one that we did. And you will, be, you will find the truth that sets you free and what the power of God does. So as we continue in verse 16 of Romans chapter 6, it says, Do you not know when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience or slaves to the one whom you obey? Well, what happens if you continue to sin? It says, if of sin, well, the result is death or obedience and the result is righteousness. In verse 17, it says, But thanks be to God that though you were a slave of sin, you became obedient from the heart. It's that whole heart thing that has to happen. To that form of teaching to which now you're committed. Verse 18, Having been freed from sin, you now became slaves of righteousness. It goes on to say that we now present our members of our body as slaves to righteousness, resulting in, or, or the members of our body as slaves to righteousness in sanctification. Verse 20 says, you, when you were slaves of sin, you were free with regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you producing of those things which you are now ashamed? Because the outcome of those things is death. Verse 22, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you have your fruit in sanctification. The outcome of that life, eternal life. So again, when we look at this to be righteous or grace reigns through righteousness to eternal life, well, if there's still sin, well, then I'm sorry. That's death. That outcome is death. Sinners sin. But, but you may say, but I do good too. But I'm able to love others. Well, Jesus taught, and both in the Gospels, that sinners agape love other sinners. Is that not good? The problem is they still sin. You see, God made creation to be able to both do good and bad. But the problem is God wants to free us from the bad so that we're, we're, we become slaves only of good. To do that, we have to be born again. The old man has to be put to death. The old heart where sin dwells, the wicked thoughts that wages war to members, that has to be removed, has to be circumcised. Old heart removed, new heart implanted. New heart, new spirit. Same thing that's covered in the Old Testament. Continuing on in Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 7, some people may say, oh yeah, but Romans chapter 7, it talks about Paul. Paul says he's a slave of sin. Well, no, Paul's continuing to teach and show through the rhetorical questions of what causes your death. Uh, in chapter 7, in the beginning, first, it talks about the, uh, the married woman. In verse 2 through 5, it gives an example of this. And it says that if a woman is bound to a husband by law while he is living, but if, she's released, if he dies, she's released from the law. So if when the husband is still living, she's joined to another man, what is she called? Well, verse 3 says she's called an adulteress. But if the husband dies, she's free from the law, so she's not an adulteress if she's then joined to another man. So the Bible says in the same way in verse 4, we were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that we might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, so that, or in order that, we might now bear fruit for God. You see, until you're crucified and the old man is put to dead and the new man is made alive, you cannot bear fruit for God. You may think you do, but God rejects it because it's a bad heart. It's not fruit that God accepts. You see, in verse 5, it says, While we were in the flesh, the sinful uh, desires of the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. Covetousness, anger, hate, lust, greed, slander, lie, all those things, uh, those are the things that used to be at work in the members, inside of you, in your heart, and outwardly in your members. The problem is, that that only bears fruit for death. But when you're released from the law, or you die to the law um, through which you were bound, so that you can now serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of letter. It's a different life. Now, for those people who like to point out on Romans chapter 7, well, uh, again, he's proving the point of what was the cause of, of his death. In verse 13, the rhetorical question is, Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me, being the law? Is the law the cause of death? No, the law points out the sin in your life. And he says, rather, it's sin. It's sin 
in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. It's the sin the cause of your death. The commandment is holy, righteous, and good. So now he explains why the sin is the cause of your death and what better uh, scenario or example to show but the old man who was a slave of sin. He says in verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh sold into the slavery to sin. This is a man who's still sold as a slavery to sin. He hasn't been set free. He's not a slave to righteousness. He's a slave to sin. Well, what does a slave look like? How do they think? How do they talk? Verse 15, for what I am doing, I do not understand. Oh, this is like the man from Romans chapter 3. I'm a wicked man. I don't understand. Verse 15, he says, I'm not practicing that which I would like to do, but I'm doing or practicing the very thing I hate. Hmm. This person doesn't do any good that they want to do. They only do the thing that they hate. They don't understand. They're a slave of sin. Yep, that sounds like that wretched man of Romans chapter 3 who's still condemned because he's under the law, he hasn't been free. It sounds like the man in Romans chapter 6, who is still condemned, death still reigns in him because he hasn't been crucified with Christ. He's still a slave of sin. Oh, and this thing where I'm doing the very thing that I hate, uh, or practice, you know, these are the same word, it's the same word in tense that, used, that is used in John when it says those who commit sin or sin or practice sin, however, whatever word you want to throw in there. Uh, same verb form, same verb uh, that's used there when it says those are sons of the devil. So people want to say they aren't the person in 1 John chapter 3, but yet they want to claim that they're this person in, John, in Romans chapter 7. And they don't even realize that the person in Romans chapter 7 is the man that's condemned, who's still a slave of sin, doesn't understand, only does the thing that he hates. So what does this prove? Well, I'll tell you what it proves. Verse 16, remember the question was, what's the cause of my death? Is it the law or is it sin? But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. Remember the rhetorical question earlier? See, the argument was that the law is good, it's sin that's bad. The law isn't bad, it's a sin that dwells within us. So if you're still sinning, because sin still dwells within you, then I must ask you, when were you ever crucified? How can you say that you're the righteous man when righteousness, you, you continue to be a slave of sin? Your members aren't a slave of righteousness. He goes on to say in verse 17 here in Romans chapter 7, So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. There you go. Sin still dwells in him. Sin still lives in his heart. Because this person still has a bad heart. It lives in him. It dwells in him. It per continues to produce. So when people sit there and they have to confess their sins every day, every night, well, of course, because sin dwells in you. It's still inside your heart. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my body, for the willingness is present, but the doing of the good is not. And so there's this law. You see, the law will convict you of sin. The law brings about the knowledge that, oh, gee, I'm a sinner. The problem is the law cannot free you from sin. Works of the law, being convicted by it, no matter how hard you try, it only continues to prove that you're a transgressor. And he continues to repeat in verse 20 that he it continues... Um, or in verse 19, the good that I want to do, I do not do, but I practice the very evil I do not want. But if I'm doing the very thing I don't want to do, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells within me. Again, stating it twice. So I find then the law. Evil is present in me. That's right. It lives in him. It's still in his heart because he's not the man that's been set, from, set free from sin. He's still a slave of sin, just as he said when he opened into it. This is the old man or the old Paul. This isn't him currently. Some people say, oh, but he's speaking in the present tense. Oh, just like what he did in, in, in Timothy 2 when he said, I am chief of all sinners. Yeah, used to be. Now he goes on and he says, I, I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war with the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin and my members. His members are still a slave of sin. He hasn't been crucified. He hasn't been set free. He hasn't been spiritually baptized. This person, the person that he's talking about, whether it's the reflection of the old Paul or, again, him using his example, because many times people would use themselves in examples when they would speak a story. So he says, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Now, a lot of people get confused by verse 25. Well, verse 25 is, is saying, well, what's the solution? Well, thanks be to God, you know, this is still hit, you know, he, he's trapped. Um, on, on the one hand, with my mind, I'm a slave to the law of God. But on the other, with my flesh, I'm a slave to the law of sin. So how do you get set free from the law of sin? Well, the answer is in the next chapter if you keep reading, but people like to stop right there. 
You see, this person wants to know God. They acknowledge the law of God in the mind, but they're still a slave of sin and their members. Chapter 8 tells us how do we come into this righteousness of God. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, depending on what Bible you're using, King James Version, the Byzantine text, has that. Um, other ones, they don't have that, but it's repeated later in verse 4. So the statement's still there. Um, it's just whether or not it's repeated twice. But the whole point is, how do you walk? Again, is this a righteousness that's just in the mindset? Or is it a righteousness that's actually outward? It's produced. It does something in our body. Well, clearly, as you've seen, as we've been reading through Romans, it's whether or not what your members are a slave to. What, what fruit is produced in your body? This gets back to, as sin reigned in death, even so righteousness or grace reigns through righteousness to eternal life. It gets back to what is grace. Again, if you didn't listen to the grace episode that we did, you need to listen to that. So you can let God's word instruct you on what these things are. The problem is we get confused with terminology by listening to the wisdom of man. We, we forget, we get, we, we get uh, the word of God hidden from us, and we, man messes up all the definitions and the terminologies. But that's the work of the devil. The devil, devil's behind that. He preaches and proclaims the word of God, but in a disguise, and he schemes to twist and deceive. Now, in chapter 8, verse 2, it says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. That's right, there's a law. It's called the Spirit. The Spirit that gives life. The same Spirit of life that was in Christ, if it's in us, that same Spirit has set us free from the law of sin and the law of death. You see, what the law could not do, the written law in verse 3, You can try to conform to the written law all you want, but works of the law cannot change you. We already know that, but the Spirit can. So again, in verse 3, what the law could not do, weak as it was in the flesh, God did, sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, in you, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's right. Did you hear that? You see, we're beyond belief. We're into what does a saving belief do? What does a saving faith do? Well, one who truly understands what it is, what it means, and what it does, you realize it crucifies, it puts to death the old. It circumcises the sinner's heart, gives you a new heart. It frees you from being a slave of sin and makes you a slave of righteousness so that you now walk according to the Spirit. You see, those who walk according to the Spirit, the requirement of the law is fulfilled in them. That's right. There is a requirement of the law. The law must be settled. God's willing to wipe away all the sins of the past. Did you know in Hebrews it says Jesus died for the sins committed under the old covenant? Not the new. You see, the new covenant, we're to become the holy living sacrifice. We'll be covering that in an episode soon here as well. How we're commanded to live, the holy sacrifice, to walk in a manner worthy as God commands. Now, continuing down, in Romans chapter 8, it talks about those who are in the flesh. In verse 8, cannot please God. It's impossible. You still walk in the flesh. You still produce fruit of the flesh, sin. You cannot please God. However, verse 9, if you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, and the sin has been put to death, but the Spirit is alive. Why? Because of righteousness. The righteousness, we already covered it earlier. Are you a slave of righteousness? Does your righteous, you, do your members of your body produce the fruit of righteousness? Remember, you can't be producing both kinds of fruit. You can't be married to both natures. That's the adulterous woman. You get rejected. Israel tried that. Didn't go well for him. Read about it. We've covered it in many of the episodes. So then, brethren, verse 12, we are under debtors. We are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. You see, if you're still living according to the flesh, you will die. But if you're living by the Spirit, you're putting to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. For all those who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. This gets that back to righteousness. It's a life. It's how you're living. What is being produced in your members? As you continue to look later in Romans chapter 13, it talks about, again, what does it mean to love? What does it mean to fulfill the law? Well, in, in Romans chapter 13, verse 8, it says, Owe no one to anyone except to love your neighbor. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For, the, for this, the law says you should not commit murder, you should not um, commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not covet. If there's any other commandment, any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, why is that? Well, verse 10, because love does no wrong. 
Love does no wrong to a neighbor. You see, you don't sin against a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. It gets back to what's in your life. What's in the members? Righteousness or sin? It is an outward life. Sin is to be put to death. It's not to be alive. Just as he continues to say as you read, he says some people, they need to wake from sleep. Salvation is nearer than when we believe. The night is almost gone. The day is near. Therefore, let, lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Some people haven't put on the armor of light. It goes on in verse 14 and says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and make no provision for the flesh in regard to the lusts. Uh, as you continue to go into chapter 14, it tells us in verse 16, Therefore do not let what is uh, a good thing for you be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. He who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. Gets back to how are we living? What does our life look like? And this isn't all things. And, and, and here they're talking about um, you, you know, how you're conducting yourself with brothers and whether or not you're uh, um, eating food and hurting your brother because he doesn't think you should. The whole thing, it's about how are we live in our life. Are we living it in righteousness, peace, joy? Is it all by the Holy Spirit? It's a yes or a no. Moving over to 2 Corinthians, uh, talking again about righteousness and the, the new creation that's discussed in the book of 2 Corinthians. And that's in uh, chapter 5. So chapter 5, uh, we'll start in verse 17, when it talks about being controlled by love. <sighs> Actually, that's verse 14. So it talks about, For the love of, God, uh, love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. See, our life is no longer to be for ourselves, but for Christ. What is that life supposed to look like? Well, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, verse 17, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. They're done away with. Behold, new things have come. All these things are from God who reconciled us to himself and gave us the many, uh, reconciled us through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So we now go out the same way. You see, when we come to God through Christ and our sins, our previous sins are forgiven us, we become ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Verse 21, he made him who knew no sin be sin on our behalf, so that what? So that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. That's right. We are to become the righteousness of God in Christ. Just as Christ came, we're to walk in the same manner. We're to demonstrate that. He then goes on and says, listen, make sure we beg you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Chapter 6, verse 1. Well, what does it mean to receive the grace of God in vain? Well, he tells them, you aren't to give any, any offense in anything so that you don't discredit the ministry in verse 3. But you're going to commend yourselves as servants of God. It doesn't matter if you're in afflictions, hardships, distress, beatings, imprisonments, tumults, labors, sleeplessness, hunger. No, it doesn't matter. But in verse 6, in all purity and knowledge and patience and kindness in the Holy Spirit and genuine love and the word of truth and the power of God by the weapons of righteousness for the left and the, and the right. That's how we're to conduct ourselves. That is how we're to conduct ourselves. It is a life, a life of living and walking and righteousness. But you see, there's a problem. Some people still don't get it. They don't understand. They don't understand that there's a distinguishment. There's a separation. You have to separate yourself from the wicked man. You see, in verse 11, he says, Our mouth has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart is open wide. You are not restrained by us, but you are restrained by your own affections. He then gives them several imperative commands commands them to stop being bound together with unbelievers. What partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? Again, it's a life. What life are you now living? What fellowship does light have with darkness? What harmony does Christ have with Belial? What, co what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? What agreement does a temple of God have with idols? But we're the temple of the living God. Just as he says, I will dwell among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my, my people. So in verse 17, it says, Therefore, imperative command, come out from their midst and be separate and do not touch what is unclean and I will welcome you. 
and I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You cannot continue to live with sin. Oh, no. Oh, no, not at all. Uh Uh-uh. Continuing on, let's go over and look at Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians also uh, talks about this and the righteousness of God that's to be living on us and the new life that we have. Now, again, in in Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about, and you were being dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, which is the devil, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Again, the spirit of the devil. Well, that's how they used to live. They formerly walked that way. That's right. They formerly walked in wickedness, in sin, when they were dead, when they were sons of the devil, sons of disobedience, the spirit of disobedience. Paul acknowledges with the people that were with him in verse 3, among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of the flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Well, that's an unrighteous man. That's not the righteous man. That's the old man, the wicked man. You don't continue to live that way. You formally, formally, formally. Well, what was the change? What happened? Well, chapter 3, and we went through the whole episode in Ephesians. If you haven't listened to it, uh, I encourage you to listen to it. But it talks about how we've granted, God the Father has granted us to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man. This is chapter 3, verse 16. So that, again, Christ can dwell in our hearts, we can be rooted and grounded in love. In verse 19, that we can know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, and that we, you, might be filled up to all the fullness of God. That's right, all the fullness of God. All the fullness of God. So that now God is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that you can ask or even think or imagine, according to what? According to His power. His power that works inside of you. That's right, from that fullness of the deity of God. It's the power of God that produces a righteousness inside of us. A new man. Now we're going to, he's going to explain what that looks like in Ephesians chapter 4. You tell me, is this a a righteousness that is just in an ideology or some title? No. No, it's, it starts from the heart. It's a new creation that produces a new kind of fruit. In chapter 4, verse 13, it talks about those who become or added to the body of Christ. In verse 12, three things have to happen. Attain to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, and to the perfect man. That's right, teleos, the perfect man. To the measure of stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. There it is again. The same fullness that Christ had. All the fullness of deity. Well, that's what we read about earlier in chapter 3. Now, that person, it says in verse 14, as a result, is no longer to be an infant. Remember, infants don't have the Spirit of God. We covered that in Galatians. Listen to that episode. Um, They haven't received the Holy Spirit yet. They're still slaves of sin and slaves of things of the world. It's discussed in Galatians. Well, they're tossed here and there by waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. That's most people who go to church. Most people who call themselves Christians. They don't know the truth. They haven't heard the truth. They're deceived. They're still trying to figure out. If you really challenge them on what they believe, they would struggle to actually show you in the Bible what they believe. They could point to a verse like John 3, 16, and they don't know it's conditional. And when you go through and say, what does it really mean to believe? Or keep reading the book of uh, John, explain what it actually means. They don't understand. They can't find their gospel in the book of Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Uh, They don't know their gospel in many other books. They don't know the gospel of Peter. They're really biblically illiterate. Uh, They haven't been spiritually taught and been fed real food. Um, These are the people that are deceived. They can't come to faith. They're still being bounced around by all these winds and doctrines. They're the infants. But those who grow up, Those who in verse 17, so this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles walk. Well, it's because many of them in the church were walking that way. Well, how's that? In the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. Yep, that's most of the people in the church, unfortunately, because they're still infants. They haven't been set free. They don't have the Spirit of God. They don't have power. So in verse 20, it says, but you did not learn Christ in this way. Well, if indeed you've heard of him, if, if you've been taught in him, just as the truth is in Christ. Well, what was this truth in Christ? Well, that in reference to your former manner of life, you'll lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. That man was to be done away with. 
and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Well, what does it mean to put on Christ or to put on that which is made in the likeness of God, righteousness and holiness of the truth? Well, as you keep reading, it tells us what that means. It's not just some cloak or title where you're still a slave of sin and you can't stop sinning. Oh, no, 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 no. No, he says, therefore, we're to lay aside falsehood. We're to speak truth. Verse 26, you're to be angry and do not sin. Verse 27, you aren't to give the devil an opportunity. Verse 28, you're to steal no more, but you're to share with those who have need. Verse 29, you're to have no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, nothing, but only that which gives grace and is good for edification. You're to not grieve the Holy Spirit. You're to have no bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, or slander uh, in you. No malice. All of that is to be put away. And chapter 5, verse 1, it says you'd be an imitator of God. Verse Chapter 5, verse 2, you're walk in love just as Christ. Really? There's to be no immorality, no impurity, no greed. There's to be no filthiness, no silly talk, no coarse jesting. None of that. He says, don't you know that with certainty no immoral or impure or covetous or uh, man or an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God? Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. People say, oh, no, 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 I'm not that person. I'm not an idolater. I'm not this. I said, well, you were a son of disobedience. Before you came to Christ, you were a son of disobedience. Everyone's born as a son of disobedience, and the wrath of God is upon them. We read that in the very beginning of chapter 2. Everyone's born that way. You see, in the eyes of God, it doesn't matter to what extent outwardly your sin is displayed. The sin all starts in the heart. Somebody has the anger of man. They don't say a single word. God says you're guilty of murder. Another person has the anger of man. They curse. Still, guilty of murder. Another man has the anger of man. They push, they shove, they strike with their fist. God says guilty of murder. And another man goes out and physically commits murder. God says guilty of murder. But somehow man looks at it and says, oh, no, no, no. The first person, no, he didn't sin. He didn't do anything. The second person, ah, he just got a little angry, maybe said some words. No, in the eyes of God, it's all murder. And that's what people don't understand. They, they're, they're redefining what God defines and how God sees you. Idolatry, they're like, oh, I don't worship a rock or a stone or a tree. Do you put the world ahead of God? Is God absolute first? Or is your life just busy, filled with work and pleasures and chasing this and chasing that? I'm sorry. In the eyes of God, you're an idolater. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he already defined, he says, you, uh, you sit down, you eat, you drink, you get up, you go play. It's like, yep. That's idolatry. That's idolatry. America is full of idolaters. America produces them continually. We must understand and discern things through the eyes of God and not the eyes of man. You see, in verse 7, still in chapter 5, he says, Therefore do not be partakers with him. You were formerly in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Command to walk as children of light. The fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth, proving what is pleasing to the Lord. Again, what does your life look like? You see, this righteousness, it's your life. What fruit do you produce? What is the proof in your life? Moving on, let's go look at Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, the prayer as Paul is praying. He says in chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. Well, what's real knowledge? What does that mean? Well, verse 10, So that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Christ Jesus, to the glory and praise of God. Again, it's back to that righteousness. It does a work inside of us. It comes through faith. It's the gift of the Spirit, the gift of righteousness. It does a work so that we can be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Being filled with all the fruit of righteousness, it is the only fruit that God produces. Would God consider you righteous as He defines it? 1 Timothy, uh, some, some additional contrasts. In chapter 1, it talks about uh, the law and, again, the difference between a, a righteous man and, and a, a wicked man. Uh, so in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, it says, We know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person. Again, we're distinguishing. But it's made for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly, the sinner, for the unholy, the profane, 
those who kill their fathers and mothers, mothers for murders, for immoral people, for homosexuals, kidnappers, liars, perjurers, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. Anything. Anything against the, the ways of God. Any sin. The law is for the lawbreaker. The sinner. Are you still a sinner? Do you still break the law? You see, when you break the law, you're now a lawbreaker. You're now under the law. As we read in Galatians chapter 5, uh, those who are led by the Spirit are no longer under the law because the fruit of the Spirit only produces the things and it does nothing which is contrary to the law. Therefore, you're no longer under the law. That's how God explains it. Go read it if you haven't read it. Listen to the episode that we did on the book of Galatians. Again, God does a work. He does a work. Righteousness. It's a change inside that has an outward lasting result. Sin is removed. Righteousness now reigns. At the end of 1 Timothy, chapter 6, he talks uh, about, again, the man of God. In verse 11, he was referring above about, you know, those who desire the things of the world and money. He says, flee from these things. Imperative command. Flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or blemish or blameless until the appearing of of our Lord Christ Jesus. Again, it's a lifestyle. It's a righteous lifestyle, an impossible life that you can only live if you've been born again, spiritually baptized, old heart of sin removed so it no longer dwells in you, and you have the new heart. In 2 Timothy, it talks about the firm uh, foundation of God having this seal. Well, first it talked about people who go away astray from the truth, because that does happen. But he says in verse 19 of 2 Timothy chapter 2, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. Hmm. What is the firm foundation of God? The Lord knows those who are His, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain or turn away from all wickedness. No longer live in wickedness. No longer live in sin. That's the firm foundation of God. You see, that's the righteous man. Are you that righteous man? If there's any question, he continues to explain it. He gives us an example of what it means to be that righteous man or the the man who isn't, who's still enslaved, who still has wickedness in his life. Now, in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, some for honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, which only God can, it's in the heart, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, fully sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. That's right, good works, not evil works. Verse 22, now flee from youthful lusts, pursue righteousness. That's right, because that's how we're to be living, being led by the Spirit of God. Faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Do you have a pure heart? All starts in the heart. Remember, only the pure in heart will see the face of God. Jesus taught that in Matthew chapter 5. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce curls. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, and patient when wrong, when wronged. With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if, if perhaps God might grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, that they might come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do His will. You still struggle with sin? Sin still dwells in your heart? You still do the will of the devil. I don't care if you say you do good. Sinners can still do good. The problem is, by definition, they're still a sinner. They can't escape it. They still do what the will of the devil. They're still ensnared. They have not come to the knowledge of the truth. It requires humility. We did an episode on that. God resists the proud, but grace gives grace to the hum- a humble. Humility is a requirement to come, come to God. Let's go to Titus. And Titus. Again, this this righteousness that we're talking about. Well, again, it's a life. You see, there's there's many people, actually talks about there's many rebellious men, uh, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision or the the false religious, 
Um, it says they must be silenced because they're overturning people's face. They aren't, they aren't teaching the truth. Um, one of them in verse 12, this is chapter 1, verse 12 of Titus, uh, a prophet of their own said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Some people may say, well, that's not a kind, kind of thing to say. Well, it's the truth. Verse 13, this testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely so that they might be sound in the faith. Not paying attention to Jewish myths, or like I'd like to call it, um, false Christian pastors who preach myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. They don't turn people to the truth. They turn them away from the truth. See, the devil will still preach Christ. He'll preach the Spirit of God and the gospel, but not in truth. At verse 15, to the pure, all things are pure. We have to those who are pure, who have been wholly sanctified with a new heart. But those who are defiled and unbelieving, remember Jesus said those that still have the bad heart, bad thoughts, they're still defiled. They're unbelieving. Hebrews talks about you can say you believe in God, but if you disobey, your disobedience is unbelief. You're an unbeliever. It says to those people, nothing is pure. Why? Because both their mind and their conscience is still defiled. They still have the bad heart or the bad conscience. You see, they confess to know God in verse 16, but by their deeds, they still deny Him, being detestable, disobedient, and disqualified for any good deed. So God says, again, it's your life. It's an inward change, whether or not you've had a true inward change by the Spirit of God and whether or not the Spirit of God lives within you. It eliminates one kind of fruit, and it only allows you to produce a new kind. What's the grace of God? Is it just some title or cloak? No. In verse 11 of chapter 2 of Titus, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Well, that's a good thing, but what is it? Instructs us to deny ungodliness, deny worldly desires, and to live sensibly, to live righteously, and to give, live godly in the present age right now. Is that the righteous life you're living? Is it manifested in your members? Is the Spirit of God reign supreme in your life? Or do you struggle with sin? Have you not overcome? Are you like the churches that Jesus warns in the book of Revelation that He's going to come and wage war against you, that you are not going to overcome? Please, I pray, wake up. Only the truth of God can set you free. We're going to cover those really shortly. We're going to make a quick stop in James, then Peter's, 1 John, and Revelation. It's a lot of good truth here. As you continue to look at Titus, uh, we, we know what it isn't. In verse chapter 3, verse 3, when he talks about what the grace of God isn't, he says, We also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice, envy, hateful, hating one another. You see, that's not the fruit of the Spirit. That's the fruit of the flesh. Those things only result in death. Those who continue to do those things and can't escape them, they don't inherit the kingdom of heaven. We are told that in Ephesians. We're told that in Galatians. We're told that in Colossians. We're told that in many different books. Jesus spoke those things. Have you been renewed? Do you now walk in good deeds of the Spirit? Spiritual good fruit. Let's look at James. In the book of James, it starts off and says, Consider it all joy, brethren. Chapter 1, verse 2. When you encounter various trials or temptations, knowing that the Proof of your faith is producing endurance. Endurance must be having its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's right, lacking nothing. The perfect man, the man that's blessed. Who is that man in verse 12? Blessed is the man who perseveres under temptation or trial. Once he's been approved, he'll receive the crown of life. Huh, that's right, you have to produce righteousness. It's the proof of your faith. Do you have a proof of your faith? Uh, verse 16, he says, Stop being deceived, my beloved brethren. Well, why is that? Well, people were deceived. They thought they had fellowship with God, but they still had the anger of man. They couldn't bridle, bridle their tongue. They were hearers and not doers. Well, those people are being deceived. He says, stop being deceived. It's a command in verse 16. Verse 17 says, God only gives perfect gifts. He supposed, the intent was to bring us forth by the word of truth so that we'd be kind of first fruits. So then in verse 19, he says, This you know, my beloved, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. The anger of man, no, can't achieve the righteousness of God. It's sin. It's murder. The anger of man cannot achieve the righteousness of God. What's the command and instruction in verse 21? Therefore, put aside all filthiness, all that remains of wickedness, and in humility, imperative command, receive the word implanted which is able to save your soul. Are you living righteously or do you still struggle with filthiness, wickedness? Do you still have the anger of man? Okay, that's not a righteous man, that's a wicked man. 
you are still commanded in humility to receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul, because you have not. In verse 22, you're commanded to become doers of the word and not hearers who deceive themselves. That's right. You still struggle. You have those things. You're a doer or you're a hearer. You are not a doer. You deceive yourself. You see, if you're a hearer and not a doer, you're like the man who looks at his face in the mirror. You goes away and you forget what you look like. But it's the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and is able to abide by it, not being a forgetful hearer, but the person who's an effective doer, that man will be blessed. You think you're religious, but you can't bridle your tongue. You deceive your own heart. Your religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God our Father is to visit orphans and widows in their distress. And with respect to yourself, what does it say? Keep oneself unstained by the world. You see, that's a righteous man as evidence in the outward life, but it all starts on the inward. It's a work that only God can do. Are you that righteous man? Chapter three, many people, some people know this one. A lot of pastors know this. They teach this in their seminary school. Seminary school. Yep. Taught by the devil. That's what most of those places do. They take the word of God and they neuter it. They don't preach the whole truth. They'll tell people this verse in chapter three, verse two, for we all stumble in many ways. They'll say, see, right there, he says, we all stumble in many ways. Well, that's right. That's one group of people. What's the other group of person if you keep reading? If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Well, we already know if you stumble in what you say, your religion is worthless. You can't bridle your tongue. Jesus taught, oh, you continue to stumble. You can't stop stumbling. Your whole body gets cast into hell. That's right. There's one group of people, the old man, that stumbles in many ways. They all stumble in many ways. That's the man, everyone born into the world. And then there's the perfect man that's able to bridle the entire body. And it talks about the tongue. The tongue defiles the life. It's a member set among our members. That which defiles the entire body and sets on course the fi- of our life. Uh, or sets on fire the course of our life and it's set on fire by hell. In verse 6. But then people will say, oh, but no one can tame the tongue. He says, no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. You're right. That's in verse 8. No one can tame the tongue. No man can tame the tongue. It's an impossible work. But God can. Gets back to the wicked man, the man in darkness, the fool. He can't tame his tongue. But the righteous man can because he has the power of God. God does it for him. He goes on and says, the person that can't tame their tongue, with it we bless our Lord and Father, with it we curse many who have been made in His image. He says, from the same mouth come forth, forth both blessing and cursing. My brother, these things cannot be this way. Can a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? No. Can a fig tree produce olives or a vine figs? No. Can salt, nor, nor can salt water produce fresh. Jesus was clear in this. You cannot be hot and cold. You cannot be fresh and bitter. You cannot be bad or good. You cannot be light and dark. You cannot serve two masters. It cannot be that way. Sorry. But people will take the word of God and twist it. And they'll they'll say, oh, we all stumble in many ways. Okay, run from that person. That person's of the devil. They may have good intentions, but they're still under the the bondage of iniquity. And then they're ensnared by the devil. They're deceived while they're deceiving others, just as God warns in 2 Timothy. Who Who is wise and understanding among you in verse 13? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, and the gentleness of wisdom. That's right. If you have bitter, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. Don't deceive yourself. You have that in your heart. You have that in your thoughts. Sorry, I'm, uh, that's not from God. Nope. See, the wisdom of God is pure, peaceful, rental, uh, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy hypocrisy and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That's right. The fruit of righteousness. It's a life. It's a result. Are you righteous? Or do you still have quarrels and conflicts amongst you? Well, what's the source of those quarrels? Is it not your pleasures that wage war in your members? Chapter four, verse one, you lust and you don't have, so you commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight in your quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You know what God says about you? You adulteress. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Whoever wishes to make himself a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Have you made yourself an enemy of God? Do you not know? Or do you think that Scripture speaks to no purpose when God says He jealously desires the Spirit He has made dwell in us? The problem is God only gives greater grace to those who are humble, but He resists the proud. Submit yourself to God. 
Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable, mourn, and weep. If you're still that old person, you don't have the Spirit of God. You still need to humble yourself and find grace. Do you have the righteousness of God or do you not? It's evident. It's evident in your life whether you have it or whether you don't. 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Has the Holy Spirit done its sanctifying work in you? Is it completed? Are you able to now obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood? That's how Peter opens up. A lot of people get focused um, on verse 3 and 4 there. Oh, it's all about, I have an inheritance. I have eternal salvation. It can never be undone. Well, you aren't listening. It's a hope. It's a living hope. It's a hope of salvation to obtain an inheritance which is undefiled, imperishable. It will not fade away. It's reserved in heaven. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Hasn't been revealed yet. It's a hope. If you endure to the end, do you have a proof of faith? Do you have a proof of faith in verse 7? Do you overcome the trials when you're tested by them, when you're distressed by trials? Is your proof of faith evident that even though tested by fire, is it found a result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Christ? Or does it result in sin and failures? Have you prepared your mind for action in verse 13? Are you keeping sober? Do you fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Christ? What does that look like? Verse 14, as obedient children, no longer conforming to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance. Are you like the ignorant person that we talked about in Ephesians? Still struggle with sin? Do you still have former lusts that are in your members that you cannot overcome? Thoughts? Struggles? Well, then you're still the former person. You see, the new person no longer does that. They're able to be obedient through the Spirit of God because they've been sanctified. Like the Holy One who called them, they are holy themselves in all their behavior. Not some, all. Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Is that you? In chapter 2, verse 1, put aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Is all that out of your life? Are you now the holy and living sacrifice? Offering up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. God only accepts holy, unblemished sacrifices. Is that you? Verse 11 of chapter 2. Beloved, I, I beg you as aliens and strangers, abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. So even in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Do you abstain from all fleshly lusts or sin? You know that sin wages war against the soul. Are you the righteous person or are you still the sinner? Which one are you? You see, it gets right down to what's evident in your life. This isn't just some ideology in the mind. This isn't just some title. This is your life. Such is the will of God in verse 6, uh, 15, that by doing right, you might silence the ignorance of foolish men. Do you do right? Do you live the righteous life? Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Are you a slave of God? Are you a slave of righteousness? Or do you still have evil or sin in your life? Are you even in the grace of God? Verse 19 of chapter 2. For this is, this is grace. If for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. Is that what you do? Or do you sin? What credit is there if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure it with patience? Sorry. Actually, that's grace. There is no grace. You have no grace with God when you sin and are beaten for it and you endure it with patience. But if you do what is right and suffer for it, and patiently endure. This, this is grace with God. That's grace with God. Then it says, for you've been called for this purpose. This is your purpose. I just happened to also be Christ, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Well, how are you to be living? Would you say that Christ was righteous or he just had a cloak or a title? No, most people would say, oh no, absolutely, he was righteous. Well, this is your purpose. This was the example he left for you. You want to be walking in the grace, the same grace that Christ walked in? Commit no sin. No deceit is allowed to be in your mouth. While being reviled, you don't revile in return. While suffering, you utter no threats. Is that you? That's the righteous man. That's what you're commanded. That's your purpose. That is your purpose. While suffering, you live the same life. You see, in verse 24, he bore uh, himself... And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we, might, we being dead to sin, might live to righteousness. Do you live to righteousness? Is it, is it, are you a slave of righteousness in your members? Or do you still struggle with sin? Do you have to confess your sins every night? Sin is in the thoughts. As Jesus said, that's what defiles you. Have you been cleansed? 
Who's the one who inherits a blessing? Chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you be of one mind, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you are called for this purpose, that you might inherit a blessing. The one who desires to, uh, to love life and to see good days, he must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and he must do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. His ears attend to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Do you still sin? Or does your life reflect the other man, the righteous man, who has no deceit in his mouth, no evil speaking? He's turned away from evil. He doesn't do sin anymore. He only does good. Is that you? Well, God's telling us who the righteous man is and who isn't. You see, we're, we're, we're throwing away the myths and the lies that tr- people try to say something different. You see, in verse 13, it says, Who's there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? Or do you still sin? Do you do evil? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. That's right. If you suffer for the sake of righteousness, just as Christ. In verse 17, it's better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong, just as Christ. Christ also died this for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, though you might bring us to God goes on in chapter 4 verse 1 says therefore since Christ suffered in the flesh arm yourself for the same purpose because he who has suffered in the flesh has stopped from sin he ceased from sin so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lust of men but now for the will of God is that you have you stopped sinning do you now live for the will of God this is your purpose you are to, this is to be your purpose. This isn't, yes, Christ lived that life, but he says, this is your purpose. This is your life that you're supposed to live. Have you done that? Are you that righteous man? Yes or no? As you continue, he says, to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, chapter four, verse 13, keep on rejoicing. So at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice, rejoice with exultation. If you're reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory of God rests on you, but you got to be careful. Imperative command, you better make sure that you don't suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a troublesome meddler. Do you still sin? Anger of man, murder, evil thoughts, that's what defiles you. But if you suffer as a Christian, then you're not to be ashamed, but to glorify God in this name. You see in verse 17, it says, For it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. If it begins with us first, then what will, become of the out- what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? If it's with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? That's right. Those that are righteous live righteously. It's the power of God in them. Sin has been put to death. Those who sin, they're still sinners. It's going to be a very difficult day for them. Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God, that's right, suffer according to the will of God, suffer without sinning, they shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is good. So, what does our life look like? Which person are we? And Second Peter, just a couple highlights. Have you become a partaker of the divine nature? You see, God granted us to become a partaker of the divine nature in chapter 1, verse 4, so that having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust, that's what we're to escape. So we're now to live, applying all diligence in our faith, we're to supply moral excellence and moral excellence Knowledge, knowledge, mastery, mastery, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, love. If these qualities are yours and increasing, then they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if you lack these things, then you're blind. You're short-sighted. You have forgotten the purification from your old sins. That's assuming you were ever purified in the first place. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Remember, the people that stumble, they get cast into hell. In this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. There you go. Peter just told you how to guarantee your entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Do you walk in those qualities of righteousness? That's right. It's an outward life as a result of an inward change. Because you are now a partaker of the divine nature. You are now filled with all the fullness of God. You have no excuse to not to live any life other than that which Christ lived. You have no excuse. Test yourself. Examine yourself. See if you pass a test, unless you realize this about you, that Christ is not in you. Do you fail or do you pass? God commands us to examine ourselves, to test us with that very test. What is in you? Don't be deceived. Sin is not from God. God frees us from, from sin. He warns us against the false teachers and the false prophets. 
says they're going to introduce destructive heresies that deny the master. They're going to speak blasphemes against the truth. This is in chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Well, what are these lies? What are these blasphemes? What are these false teachers? Well, he gives us an example. He says, If God did not spare angels when they sinned, but He committed them to hell and, and pits of darkness reserved for judgment, if He did not spare the ancient world of Noah, but preserved Noah, preacher of righteousness, when He destroyed the world of the ungodly with the flood, are you seeing a pattern here? Are you guys seeing a pattern? If He condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by, redu- by destruction, reducing them to ashes, making them an example to those who would live ungodly thereafter, sinners. If he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the conduct of unprincipled men. Then he goes on in verse 9, he says, Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation, and to keep the unrighteous, or the sinners, under punishment for the day of judgment. Did you catch all that? People who sit there and say that you can still be a sinner, and still have sin in your life? that you can never be perfect, they're liars. That's not what the Word of God says. They're these people who deny the Master. They're the people who blaspheme the Word of God. These are the false prophets and the false teachers that have existed from the beginning and continue to today. It says they will suffer and be destroyed as a wild beast. They will receive the wages of the unrighteousness which they perform. They count it a pleasure to revel or party with you in the daytime. But in the eyes of God, it says their stains, blemishes, they, they feast with you. And, or they revel with you in their deceptions as they feast with you. They, they, they join the feasts and the celebrations with the people of God. They have eyes full of adultery that are unable to stop sinning, says these people have forsaken the right way. Verse 17, their springs without water, mist driven by a storm whose black darkness has been reserved. They promise people, other people freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. In verse 19, for whatever man is overcome by this, he's enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled, the last state is worse than the first. It would be better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than having known the way of righteousness and then turn from the holy commandment that was handed down to them. How do you live? Do you still struggle with sin? Do you have to confess your sin every night? How can you think that you're a righteous person? How can you think that you've been freed from sin? How can you think that sin no longer dwells in you? That you've been circumcised with a new heart and all the wickedness and sin has been cleansed and removed from you? This is what God says. Verse 14 of chapter 3. Therefore, beloved, since you, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace, spotless, and blameless. 1 John. Look at a couple passages here, and then we'll close with the book of Revelation. You know, in 1 John, he says, If we say we have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Do you still have darkness in your life? And do you say you have fellowship with God? Well, then you lie and do not practice the truth. Now you're probably saying, oh, but I only have a little bit of darkness, not a lot. Well, did you not read the verse right below it in, verse, uh, in front of it in verse 5? This is the message we heard from him and announced to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. God doesn't let any darkness dwell with him. You cannot be enlightened and think you have darkness. Did you read the parable that Jesus talked about with light in Luke chapter 11, around like verse 33 or so? Only if you're full of light, having not a single dark speck, are you full of light. Otherwise, the light that's in you, you think you're in light? He says the light in you is actually darkness. Now remember, the first group of people he's talking to here in 1 John are those who say they have fellowship, but they don't have fellowship. That's why John's writing to them, so that they might have fellowship. That's discussed in verse 3. But they're in a church, they think they do. The problem is they still have darkness, so they lie. They do not practice the truth. But in verse 7, if you walk in the light, how? As God is light, well, then you have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' Son cleanses you from all sin. All sin. It's how you walk. This isn't just some ideology. It's how you walk. Are you the righteous man, or are you still the sinner? People say, yeah, but but look at what it says in verse 8, 9, and 10. That's right. This is telling the liar how he can come in to have fellowship with God. You see, this is the liar who has not been cleansed of all sin. This is the liar that still has sin dwelling within him. This is the liar that still has to confess his sin in humility and come to God in humility so he can be cleansed and not be the sinner anymore. If the person says they have no sin, they're deceiving themselves. The truth is not in them. They were never cleansed. People say, oh, but he says we. He says we. He says we. That's how they talked back then. 
Look, look at what he says before. If we say we, in verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. He, even though he says we, he's not talking about himself. He already established in verse 3 that he does have fellowship with God. But people want to be contentious and argumentative. They want to quarrel about words and ask controversial questions. Yep, God warned about those people. He says they have no truth in them. They're deceived. They make confident assertions and they know nothing. They are not servants of God, but servants of their own appetite. These people still need to confess so that they can be cleansed of all unrighteousness. Now, if you continue on, he talks about who are those that know him. Well, you're going to notice something. It's a righteous life. Verse 3, by this we know that we have come to know him. This is chapter 2, verse 3 of 1 John. If we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments, that person's a liar. The truth is not in them. You see, keeping the commandments of God, and you can only do that if you have a new heart, that's the righteousness being revealed through faith. That's right, the righteous man. Verse 5, whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Verse 6, the one who says he abides in him ought to walk in the same manner as he walked. That's right, walk in the same manner as Christ. Is that how you walk? At the end of chapter 2, it, talks, it says in verse 28, Now little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him at, in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. That's right. Do you practice righteousness? Do you live righteously? It all starts with a heart. If not, sorry, you aren't born of God. Chapter 3, verse 3, everyone who is having this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Have you been purified just as Jesus is pure? And verse 4, everyone who is committing sin commits lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Verse 5, you know that he appeared in order to take away sin. In him there is no sin. How much sin is in Jesus? None. How much sin and darkness is in the Father? None. How much sin and darkness do they, do they let abide with them? None. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or known him. Do you still struggle with sin? Then you don't know him. You haven't seen him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who commits or practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Do you practice righteousness just as Jesus? We saw that we just read the example in 1 Peter. Do you suffer unjustly? Do you stand in the grace of God and while you're doing good, suffer unjustly? Commit no sin, have no deceit in your mouth? Just as we're commanded to the same purpose? Well, then you don't practice righteousness as Christ does. Verse 8, the one who commits sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who has been born of God commits sin. Because God's seed abides in him, he cannot sin because he has been born of God. It all depends on what spirit you're led by. The Bible says that those who are led by the Spirit, it's impossible to carry out the desire of the flesh. The Word of God says that. Who are you? People say, oh no, they're talking about habitually sin. No, those who commit sin. Sin continues to be evident in your life. It can be called a practice. It continues to show up. It's the same word that's used in Romans chapter 7 that people want to claim and identify with that man who's a slave of sin. Same word. Is that you? Then you're the same person. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. He goes on, he says, We know that we have passed from death out of death into life because we love the brethren. The one who does not lo uh, love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And in verse 19, still in chapter 3, We know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our hearts before him. Whatever our heart condemns us. For God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and we do the things that are pleasing in his sight. What is his commandment? This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. We know by this he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. It is a righteous life that we live. If you cannot see that there's a clear evidence of righteousness in our life and how we live, then you don't understand what faith is. 
and what the righteousness of God is that comes through faith. Revelation. Real quick, we'll highlight the churches and end with two verses from the back end of the book of Revelation. Let's look at Ephesus in chapter 2. The church of Ephesus. See, the problem is they had some good deeds, but they still had sin in their heart. They still had sin, or they had come back in. They didn't remain pure and holy. He says, I know your deeds, your toil, your perseverance, that you cannot tolerate evil men. You put them to test who, uh, those to the test who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. You have persevered, you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But there's a problem. Verse 4, I have this against you. You left your first love. They left their first love. He says, therefore, imperative command, repent from where you have fallen, because they had fallen, repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you, and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Remove the lampstand. You remove the light. You have no more light. You have no spirit. You're no longer part of Christ. This was a church that had fallen. God's given them one less chance before they get broken off as a branch and cast into the fire, because they weren't continuing and righteousness and the deeds that they did at first. But people want to say that that's not the righteousness God's talking about. Okay, continue to argue against God. It's very clear if you continue to look at his, or as, at his uh, the Word of God. If we look at uh, Pergamum. And Pergamum, again, he has some good things. He says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. You hold fast my name. You do not deny my, my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful uh, my, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among where, uh, those where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, and to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. And you have some who hold to the teaching of Nicolaitans. But what's the command? Verse 16, Therefore repent. If they don't repent, I'm coming to you quickly. I will make war with the sword of my mouth. It's not a good thing. He's going to make war with the sword of his mouth. Hmm. Thyatira, I know your deeds, verse 19, your love, faith, service, perseverance, that your deeds of great are later than, or, or of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and leads my bond servants astray so they commit acts of immorality. So what's God going to do to these bond servants? He says, Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, in verse 22, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the church will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one according to your deeds. In verse 25, he says, Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. Whoever overcomes and keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. Again, righteousness. What life do you live? Do you keep your deeds to the end? Some of these people had to repent. These were some bad churches. Sardis, chapter 3, uh, verse 1. He goes on and he says, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you're alive. The problem, he says, you're dead. He says, wake up and strengthen the things that remain which you're about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it, and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I come. You have a few people in Sardis, only a few, unfortunately, who have not soiled their garments. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Again, what life are you living? Have you fallen? Did you ever receive the Spirit of God, and you were walking and living righteously, and then you've fallen? Well, this is your call now to repent and get back before you get broken off as a branch. Laodicea, in, in verse 15 of chapter 3, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You see, he tells them that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. He says that they need to buy gold refined. They need to buy from him gold refined by fire, so that they might become rich, and white garments, so that they might clothe them, clothe themselves, and cl- and um, eye salve, so that they might be able to see. It says those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. The problem is, if they don't repent, if they don't overcome, then they won't get to sit down with him on his throne. You see, these are the things that Jesus teaches. It's very clear. There's an expectation of a righteous life through a 
work that is done in a person's heart, the Spirit of God in the new heart. So we're going to end with these two verses. In chapter 19, verse 7 through 9, he says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Do you have righteous deeds? Or are you trusting in the false words of the lies that says, oh no, we have no righteousness? Well, then you never received the righteousness of God that you were then commanded to walk in. The righteous deeds of the saint is the fine linen, the white, bright linen clothes that the saints will clothe themselves with. And Revelation chapter 22, the last chapter, verse 10 and 12. And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of the book, for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. Let the one who is filthy still be filthy. Let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. And the one who is holy still keep himself, keep himself holy. Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to render to every man according to his deeds. Father, I thank you for the truth. And O oh God, that you are the one that converts and changes a man into a righteous man. A man who is then able to live and walk and righteousness is a wonderful and impossible work that you do. Father, I pray that people will humble themselves and accept the word of truth, that they'll allow the power of God to do an impossible work through a faith and the truth and the word of God and not a lie or a myth of man. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope this weekly program helped rekindle your zeal to know, love, and serve Christ day by day. If you enjoyed the program, consider subscribing and sharing with your friends. Thanks for listening.